So unless I come up with some other related topic to culinary, I think this will be the last video in the culinary series. It's slightly related to culinary in that um, has to do with how things, how regressors are correlated with each other. And oftentimes I've been approached by people and they have two covariates in their model, so a regression like this, and they want to make some conclusion. So say both um, B1 and B2 are significant, or B1 is significant and B2 isn't, they want to say, you know what, B1's better, or B2's better. And the purpose of this video is to explain why I don't think this actually makes sense. I don't think there's a way to do this. So I've been using a lot of Venn diagrams to illustrate some of the, the points with collinearity because they're handy but they can be a little misleading. And we'll see it's because um, the way the model behaves depends on how things are correlated. So this overlap corresponds to some type of correlation between X1 and Y. And likewise here, um, all these little overlapping bits uh, correspond to different correlations. And whatever those correlations are, the behaviors of the betas, or the, I'm calling them Bs today, are different. The parameter behavior will be different. Also, another important consideration that I've kind of glossed over is that when I add X2 to the model, it's doing two things. It's stealing some of X1's variability that explains why, but at the same time, it's canceling out some of this variability that's hurting X1. So it turns out that if you have a lot that doesn't overlap with the variable of interest, that's bad. So you can have kind of an assist from another covariate if it takes care of some of that badness. So I'll explain this in detail uh, through a, a set of examples. So again, the common goal um, that I hear frequently, and with reason, I'm not, I can totally understand where this comes from, is you'd like to say X1 does a better job than X2 in your model. And we want to get at these unique bits, like this little bit here. We want to say, you know what, this is smaller than this, so X2 wins. But the story is actually a lot more complicated. This is smaller than this, but what about this part here that overlaps between X1 and X2 and not Y? How is that impacting the coefficients for these bits here? Okay, so this, there's, there are a lot of moving parts here. Okay, can we get at that unique bit? Oh, again, it's this unique bit here and here. And I don't think it makes sense. And I will go through these examples to illustrate that. So I'm basing this off of a table in, in this paper, suppression and enhancement and bivariate regression. Um, right, so you have all the information here that you would need if you wanna look this paper up. Um, right. So what, what is suppression? What's enhancement? It turns out they're kind of one and the same. Suppression corresponds to uh, the betas. So some of the bad variants of a covariate is suppressed by another covariate giving it a boost. So if your Venn diagram, I know I'm still using the Venn diagram, so I'm trying to explain them more completely. So in this case, X2 is interfering with X1, but most of the interference is kind of good. It's taking away this part of X1 that's not important in terms of explaining why. So it allows X1 to do a better job. So that is suppression. It's suppressing, it's, it's counterintuitive because it seems like it would be enhancing, but it's basically suppressing this chunk of variability. Enhancement refers to R squareds, so the, from the model fit. So the sum of individual models R squared is smaller than the joint. So typically you would think that these individual model R squareds would sum up to equal the joint. That would only occur if um, X1 and X2 were independent. But um, sometimes the sum of these R squareds, so what they each explain on their own, is less than what they explain together. And that is called enhancement. And enhancement implies suppression, right? So it implies that one covariate is suppressing some um, unuseful part of another covariate. So since these two are related and to avoid further confusion, I'm only focusing on suppression here. 
Okay, so focusing on suppression. So instead of focusing on R squared values, I'm gonna focus on the betas or the Bs, I'm calling them Bs. So here are the two models. The idea is that you look at X1 by itself, you look at X2 by itself, and then you look at the model with both. So I'm using this B1.2. This is the parameter estimate for corresponding to X1 adjusted for X2. And B2.1 is the parameter estimate for X2 adjusted for X1. Okay, so hopefully that is clear. So just the first number, remember, always matches the regressor it's with. The second number is just what was adjusted out. So you could think of it that way. Okay, I'm mostly going to focus on these three estimates, B1, B2, and B1.2, but sometimes B2.1 comes into play as well. Okay, so this is a table I've reproduced directly from the paper. I will add the paper has a, a geometrical argument as well, and um, I don't know what it, I'm, I'm typically pretty good with um, geometry, um, regardless of what my, I took a, a, okay, a physics class, statics and dynamics when I was an undergrad. Um, anyway, I'm not gonna tell the story. Okay, I'm pretty good with uh, geometry, but it turns out that um, with regression, the ge geometrical arguments, they just don't always work for me. So because of that, I don't typically teach them very well, and I try to avoid doing it because it won't come out right. But if you love that sort of thing, get the paper, and it has some pictures in it that will help explain these different phenomena and the effects on the regression coefficients. Okay. So there are multiple examples. I will distribute but not run our code that illustrates each of these examples. So there's a link to that in the toolbox. You can just download it and run it yourself and compare the correlation settings to the effect on the standardized regression coefficients. Taking into consideration its data with noise, these are you know uh, properties that hold you know an infinity. Okay, so what do we have here? The first is a really simple case. We have uncorrelated regressors. So X1 and X2 are not correlated with each other. Um, there's no restriction on the correlation between uh, X2 and Y. And the phenomenon is that um, X1 and X2 are independent. So when they are independent, the simple equals partial. So in other words, it looks something like this. So it turns out the beta for X2 is exactly the same if you're looking at the first at the model with just x2 in it or the model uh, where x2 is adjusted for x1. Likewise the beta for x1 looks the same in the model with only x1 as it does in the model with x1 and x2. By the way standardized regression coefficients it just means each regressor was um, centered and divided by its standard deviation. It doesn't really you can do that to the regressor and it doesn't really change anything. Um, it just probably made the math easier to, to derive all of these properties. So I've done that in the R code. Okay, so this makes sense. This is kind of what we would expect. It's gonna get more complicated though. So this is classic suppression. So um, let's say the correlation between X1 and X2 is non-zero. And let's say the X2 has nothing to do with Y. So this is this situation that I showed earlier. So this is classic suppression because X2 is soaking up some of the bad part of X1, which then has the effect of improving the beta for X1. So you'll see in the R code that the, the betas will change and typically the p-values change accordingly. If the beta goes up, the p-value goes down. And specifically, uh, uh-oh. Mm. I think there's a typo here. Uh, this should be, let's just check the paper. Do, do, do. Beta 2, B2, less than B1, less than B1, 2. Okay, I did have a typo, but it's pretty obvious. So B2 would be zero because it's unrelated to Y. B1 will be bigger 
but B1 after adjusting for B2 will actually be even larger. So the parameter corresponding to X1 is improved when X2 is put in the model. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. My apologies, these should be switched. Okay, on to the next step. So the correlation between our X's is negative. The correlation between Y and X2 is positive. So now X2 overlaps with Y. So this is known as cooperative suppression. So we have a negative correlation, so to be clear here, this is negative, the correlation between X1 and X2, and this will be positive, the correlation between X2 and Y. And when this happens, the parameter estimate by itself is smaller than the adjusted parameter estimate for both Bs. So it's cooperative suppression. Remember, suppression makes the beta get bigger, so now both betas are increasing after being adjusted. Um, Okay, so that's just this impact of these two correlations, this one being negative and this one being positive. Next is net suppression. So here the correlation, be this is just complicated. Uh, the correlation between X1 and X2 is now positive, so we're doing the other case. Um, we already did negative, so now when it's positive, if you have this relationship, the correlation between Y and X2 is positive and then less than the product of the correlations between Y and X1 and X1 and X2. So in other words, this correlation is now positive between X1 and X2. And I'm just going to say this is complicated. These, I don't think these are rules you necessarily have to remember. But what you find then is now B21, so this is the coefficient for X2 when X1 is in the model will be negative. Um, let's see, yeah, even though the correlation between Y and X2 is positive, the adjusted B is negative and B2 is positive as it should be. B1 is going to be larger and then B1 adjusted for 2 is even bigger. Okay. Last, um, slightly different, so this is still positive. But now the correlation between y and x2 is greater than the product of the other two correlations. This is known as a redundancy, basically your partial beta. So the b21 will be less than the b2, and the 1, 2 will be less than the 1. So it's almost just kind of a normal expected thing uh, that the partial, is that normal? Yeah, maybe that's how we normally think of it. Maybe, maybe there is no normal, and maybe that's my point. Okay, again, you can run through the R code examples for all these. You want to look at the, B, the betas only. And actually, I just split it, spit out the coefficients in the code. All right, so the takeaway from this is that if your model has multiple regressors, they have a really complicated reg uh, relationship. And especially here, you can see it's, it's driven by all sorts of correlations. The correlation between the dependent variable and the independent variable and the independent variables with each other. Um, and trying to give all of the credit to one covariate typically won't make sense because that covariate's parameter estimate has something to do with that covariate and the other covariates in the model. So I'm sure you've heard this saying before, there's no I in team. Um, so it kind of applies here. There's, the regressors are working together as a team, so you can't really give credit to one. This might be an American saying. Um, Basically, they use it for sports teams. You know, you're supposed to work as a team. You're not supposed to try to win the game by yourself. Um, let me see, there's no I in team. Okay, I'll stop explaining it. All right, so that is it. Uh, please join the Facebook group, follow me on Tumblr or Twitter or all three. And thanks for your attention.